So I'd like to just throw out to um, the panelists, first of all, um, this idea of community justice that, that Greg started us off yesterday offering some uh, thoughts about what does that really mean um, and people had the chance to, to apply that to their own jurisdictions yesterday afternoon and think about how is that expressed uh, locally. Uh, and, and I wanted to just uh, ask uh, Judge Calabresi um, if, there, if there's anything um, from Red Hook's perspective, from your perspective, that you would just want to you know, kind of um, put into the mix to help us understand community justice. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. So um, we we recently had, uh, I guess, a couple years ago. You know, I, I said yesterday that I'm still learning, and um, I think I've gotten better in the last two or three years. And I just want to explain to you why, because I think I think it'll um, help. Um, our precinct expanded. One of our precincts expanded. We covered 230,000 people. One expanded. Um, uh, if somebody runs on the court during a Nets basketball game, I'm looking and I'm saying, gee, I'm going to see that guy tomorrow. That's kind of fun, you know? <laughs> Jay-Z's locker room, got, uh, Jay-Z's uh, dressing room got broken into, you know, things like that. Anyhow, but with that, with that came a target in the Atlantic uh, Terminal Mall, and more people get arrested per square foot at this target than I've ever seen in my over 30 years in the justice system. And what's interesting um, um, was that they were always going downtown to the downtown court. So they have a history of recycling through the court system to 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, 90 days, time served. They've been doing this for years. And they were then now going to hit Red Hook. And the question I had was, can we work with them? Because they're hitting us with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, one had 100 prior convictions. And it's all the same stuff. It's all the petit larceny, the shoplifting. Many of them live in the shelters. They haven't gotten any services uh, very, or, or very little services. So the question was, could we work with them? And I honestly, I wasn't sure. Um, they're very, they were fascinating. They're great because they're so used to standing next to a lawyer, getting a number assigned to them, and all of a sudden they're in Red Hook and somebody's saying to them, how can we help you? They're like looking around saying, well, you know, where am I? You know? And, um, and so what I found, and I think what, what made me a better judge, because what I learned would work, was really applying more procedural justice principles, bringing them up to the bench, talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, telling them if they've made the choice to do services, telling them it's a great choice, this is a great first step, it's a great decision. Uh, tomorrow you're gonna make, you gotta come back to court, you're gonna make my day when you come back to court, and it's true, because it literally does make my day when I see some of these people have recycled so many times actually, you know, be linked up with services and take advantage of those services. Um, so some of the things I've learned is what I'm looking for in the conversation is what's going to, wh why do they really need to get clean? It clearly isn't avoiding jail because, my God, they've you know, 20, 30, 40 prior, that hasn't really worked. So I don't want to be in a position of saying, if you don't do what you need to do, I can send you to jail for X. I don't want to be in that position. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to ask questions like, do you have any family support? And then you'll hear that they take care of their, their parents or their mom. You hear that they've got children. You hear that they've got brothers and sisters. And you take note of that. And that's why they need to get clean. And once you find out they have children, you know they, they need to get clean. Uh, and, you, and so therefore then, the next time they're in front of you, you might want to say, you know, how's your son doing? How's your daughter doing? What school are they in? Whatever, you know, all those are subtle reminders of why they need to get clean. So I don't have to say to them again, well, you're doing great, or you had a, you know, you tested positive, so if you don't do it, you need to do jail. It's really just a question of, you know, using what they have told you as a way to motivate them uh, using that in the future. So I find that really helpful. The other thing I'll, I did want to say that I, I found really helpful is I started asking, what's a good day for you to come back to court? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot behind that. I really rec recommend that question. Think about what's behind that. Behind that question is, I respect you. I respect your time. We know your involvement in the justice system is one part of your life. You will have a voice in this. You will, have, you will be part of the solution or the resolution of the matter. All that really comes from what's a good day for you to come back to court. And, what's in, and, and also practically, you, know, you don't know, most people, uh, uh, especially in the lower economic areas, they're 
you know, they have Mondays and, and Tuesdays off, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, they gotta be at work. You, you just pick a date of a Wednesday, next thing you know, they're out of a job and you haven't accomplished anything. So one, practically you wanna know it. Two, it, it, it conveys to the person, we respect you mm. and you're part of this. And so there's a lot that comes from that question. So I found that to be really helpful. So using these techniques, talking to them at the bench, looking them in the eye, finding out a little bit personal about them has really helped me deal uh, and, and work with these people. And the last thing, you know, the, the question is, you know, how can you get the police on board and some of the people in the system? The bottom line is you can produce better results. Six months into covering the, uh, the, uh, this Atlantic Terminal Mall, the 7A precinct uh, captain, uh, announced that he had reduced recidivism by 25% at a community meeting. And you know, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that's great. That's absolutely great, because he sees that there's a better way to do this. We've worked with him for a long time now, but it's, it was really nice that he can announce better results. Um, and that's how you get the police on board, produce better results. So, um, Judge Williams, uh, there you are in South Texas. Um, <coughs> I imagine in a very different uh, environment than one would find in Brooklyn. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the community that you serve and, um, and how you have evolved over the, over the years in your relationships with the community. Okay. <coughs> Good morning. Um, I have a lot of my colleagues here from Dallas. Y'all want to mm -hmm. wave? I always let them get there. I, have wow, a, I actually right. have my wow. council member for my district here from Dallas. So, Councilwoman Young, could you stand up, please? I have to give you all props. Nice. South Dallas is immediately south of downtown Dallas. And downtown Dallas and North Dallas is a very vibrant, um, well-to-do part of Texas. South Dallas is a neighborhood uh, that's struggling. It is a neighborhood of people that work, and they are the working that working people that are in below the poverty line. So, we have an interesting group. Uh, we we don't have a lot of retail in South Dallas. Um, we have some mom and pop businesses, uh, a few grocery stores. So we are kind of a food desert, and then we have. Um, a lot of young people, a lot of single family homes, single family parents, and some, some um, apartments that are not your greatest. So what we do at the court is when the people come in, what we've learned is that you're gonna treat everyone with respect. And I'm gonna give that to our court manager, Ms. Gibson. She makes sure that yeah. everyone from the security officer that checks you in, all the way to the last person that sees you will give you that respect. And of course, I model that as well to everyone who appears in court. Uh, what we have learned though is we're doing a great job, but we can't contain it just within the walls of the court. And our court is located in a community center. Uh, right next door to us is an actual medical clinic. We have a child care center also in that community center. So we're there where people can come and get the help that they need. But even with all of those things, we needed to walk outside of that community center and we needed to get more involved in the community. They know we're there because our community service restitution is done in that community. They see uh, the people that have committed those offenses as they're giving back to the community. But even with that, we still weren't reaching all of our all of the neighbors in the South Dallas community because we have those that are going to work and they're working really hard and they love their community and they want it to be better. So basically everyone in the community court got involved with an initiative that started with the uh, Children's Hospital. Children's Hospital came into South Dallas because of course of the high health issues and they started looking at children and then they realized this is more than just children, it's the whole family and then they, they realized, well, it's more than just health, so we've got to figure out a way to make this better. And they um, aligned themselves with a nonprofit, the Alliance for Greater Works, and they came up with what's called WINS, Winning in Neighborhoods Strategically. And so that was our opportunity at the courts to go outside of the walls and get involved because WINS is dealing with not only health issues, they're dealing with the housing issues that are in South Dallas, economic development uh, issues in South Dallas, and then of course there's always safety and security. So every, our court manager, I mean everyone, including myself, 
got really involved. It brought us closer to the community because community meetings were being held where you got to hear from the residents that weren't committing offenses and the residents that weren't coming in to tell you what they wanted done. Uh, but you got to actually hear from those who go to work every day, but they wanted to see improvements in their community. And so we've, WINS has been operational for about 18 months. It is a long-term strategy. However, they, we are creating good things in the South Dallas area. I co-facilitate the safety and security uh, committee along with one of the assistant district attorneys, which also gives you uh, the ability to create some wonderful relationships with another agency. And of course, we have a lot of police officers, our code officers, everyone's involved. Uh, the DA also supports the WINS initiative. Our mayor is very uh, involved with this, it, in support of it as well, as well as our city council member, uh, Young. She was actually on the committee and now she's a very big supporter when she became, uh, when she got elected to city council. Uh, she didn't, she didn't, she stepped back, but she didn't step away completely. She supports the initiative. But the beauty of the initiative for us is that we got to go in and educate the residents. And this is just taking your community justice outside of the courthouse. Uh, one of the things that we got to do was to talk to the residents and let them know that in order for you to get the services that you need, you have to make those 911 calls. We're in an underserved community where they don't trust the police. So you have to educate them that when the police see that more 911 calls are coming from this area, then they're going to put more resources in and you will feel safer as opposed to feeling like they're coming down on you. Um, the police officers were very involved, so they were the ones educating the neighbors about that. They were educating the neighbors about an app called Next Door, uh, the 311 app where you could report things anonymously instead of uh, feeling like you know your neighbors would know you were calling in. So those were some of the, the uh, initiatives that have come out so far. Another thing is that even though this is a neighborhood that's pretty much low poverty, they still have neighborhood associations. And each neighborhood association had uh, issues that they were addressing, but a lot of those were common issues. So what we did is create what's called a neighborhood association council. And we actually stole that from the LA city attorney's office. Uh, they sent it to us. We wanted to make sure that we you know, followed up and they kind of gave us some technical assistance on how to get that started. But it allowed us to create a larger organization of the different neighborhood associations so they would have a larger voice when they go to council meetings to voice their issues in their community. So we did a lot of educating and of course that's just the safety and security part of it. Housing has been doing a lot of work. The health uh, initiative is great but it all comes back to just doing community justice in your community. So that's kind of what we've done differently in Dallas besides you know we started a, a, a drug court um, and the drug court is really neat. Uh, and of course, what we do in Dallas that's also, I don't know if you're doing in other areas, is we do a lot of outreach to the different courts. So we collaborate with our federal courts, with our district, felony district courts, and what we offer those courts is the opportunity to allow their defendants who are coming back off of probation or parole an opportunity to get their permits or their license. And basically, if you're, in, if you're ever in trouble, you realize that one of the first things you're gonna have is a bunch of city citations and you can't get your driver's license. So uh, we've done outreach to those courts. They work with us by sending their defendants through our courts to handle those city citations. And they don't have to have a special citation to come to our court like the other defendants that we see. They just have to have a municipal citation. We will handle those citations, allow them to get their, per their licenses back, or at least clear those citations. And the way we do it is they are given an opportunity to do community service, and then we dismiss the cases, as opposed to them getting time served because they were incarcerated. And a lot of them don't understand that, so you have to explain it when they come to court. They're very upset. I've, I've been locked up for years, and these tickets are still here, and so I have to explain that, yes, they're still there, but if you just do this program, we're gonna end up getting them dismissed, and you'll be able to get your license. If I time serve you, that means I have to find you guilty, then I have to give you credit for time being in jail, and then you have the issue of paying the surcharges 
and if you fail to pay the surcharges, guess what? You're going to lose your license again. So once they get that understanding, they're very happy to complete the program. And a lot of them come in a little frustrated, but once they understand why we're doing it the way we're doing it, they're excited. The courts that, uh, the, fel the federal court, the federal judge is excited that we are helping her, parolees and probationers, and then the uh, district courts are very happy as well, which, uh, I won't go into it now, created another uh, initiative that we'll talk about in a little bit. So uh, thanks, Judge Williams. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of richness in that, in that answer. Um, let's go to the other side of the globe and uh, hear from Magistrate Fanning. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the area that you serve with the Neighborhood Justice Center? Sure. Thanks, Julius. And Kerry and I, and Kerry's the director of the Neighborhood Justice Centre, we've uh, come here, we're very pleased to be here, and uh, we look forward to having uh, lots of conversations with you uh, as the couple of days progress, and to renew uh, old uh, friendships. The Neighborhood Justice Centre in, uh, in Melbourne is situated a couple of, um, or a mile and a half from the centre of Melbourne. Melbourne's a city of around four and a half million, uh, we serve an area, uh, a municipal area in, uh, as I say, just outside the, uh, the centre of uh, Melbourne and serve a, a population of around 80,000 people. Uh, the centre, as I say, was, a, as Julia says, was established in 2007. It's unique. It's the only neighbourhood justice centre uh, in the country. Uh, there were possibly going to be other ones, but there's not likely to be, which is something I'll, we might talk about a bit, a bit later. I, I hear all criminal matters uh, as a in first instance court. That is, if you live within the uh, municipality, then I'm your court. And it's around 97% of all criminal matters come to uh, the magistrate's court, uh, which is the court that I preside in. Uh, so it hears what you would call uh, felonies uh, as well as misdemeanours. In fact, misdemeanours are really not a large uh, proportion of the cases. It's mostly uh, felonies that I, that I hear. So community justice is applicable to felonies as, as it is to misdemeanours, something we might want to talk about a bit further as well. Um, we have a, a, a number of services attached to, connected to the Neighbourhood Justice Centre, but what we endeavoured not to do and what we're very keen not to do is to set up an alternative, alternative service system. What we want to do and what we strive to do is contribute to, enhance and work with the existing uh, service system rather than replicate or even worse, set up another perhaps even competing service system. We want to work with the existing service systems that, e that already exist and, as I say, develop and enhance them rather than uh, set up some other new system. I remember reading in Greg's uh, book uh, in courts and it, it struck me uh, profoundly that uh, the point of that many people are now moving to courts because of the <coughs> breakdown of other institu traditional institutions like churches to resolve their problems. Uh, what we, uh, and that's, that's certainly clear in Australia as it is obviously in the US. And what we don't want to do is to have the court being the centre of every resolution of a community problem. We don't want to take all the community's problems and say, well, we're going to solve them. We have a role, we have an important role but it's not to solve all the community's problems. We want to work with agencies and organisations that uh, exist uh, and that can be developed uh, to uh, uh, assist members of the community uh, in resolving, I guess, their own problems rather than all becoming a court issue. And, and Magistrate Fanning, I think you're making a really good point that we get asked about a lot as people are planning community courts, you know, how much does it cost? How much does a community court cost? And how much does it cost to offer all of these different services that we want to include because they're, they're, they're needed by the populations that we serve? And, um, and from our perspective, um, the, the first response is, is what Magistrate Fanning uh, has said, which is, 
identifying the service providers in your jurisdiction and helping to broker uh, connections between uh, your clients and, and their clients um, and, um, and only as a last resort filling in the, the gaps um, but not trying to set up a separate you know, social service um, uh, network. So, um, so let's, let's move on for a second. We're gonna, we're gonna be talking about kind of new directions. That's part of our, our job here in this panel. But, um, but I, think, I think it's also important that we, um, that we acknowledge challenges. Uh, and um, you know, we're looking at three very well-established uh, community court uh, projects. Um, and surely there are some challenges around. So, um, so I don't know who wants to go first. Um, if nobody volunteers, Judge Calabrese is always going to help with that. Well, some of the things we're working with, I think um, there sometimes is always an issue in, uh, in treatment because you've got a prosecution, you've got a defense, uh, and every once in a while, um, Surprisingly, they don't agree with the court and with the judge uh, in terms of you know how certain things should be handled. So there's always there needs to be communication there, and, and that every once in a while is something that we continue to have to work with. Um, we are um, our next step actually just just uh, came forward uh, in terms of community work. I do housing uh, court, so uh, the New York City I do housing court for the Red Oak houses, uh, 92 buildings, 8,500 people. The landlord is New York City, New York City Housing Authority. Um, they are not the best landlord in the world. Um, and uh, we have uh, actually started um, bringing uh, New York City as a goal. We're going to bring uh, NYCHA together with the police officers that do housing, uh, that are in the housing uh, area, and the tenants. So, uh, you know, we've always had a goal to bring community and police together with the court, and now we're actually going to have a goal to bring NYCHA and the tenants together because um, the NYCHA people don't necessarily peop, uh, treat the tenants with respect. The tenants are unhappy because they have difficulty getting repairs or had difficulty getting repairs. Um, and we are always constantly monitoring those repairs, and when they're brought to our attention, we're able to get them those repairs, but, but we always need to improve communication. So that's our most recent challenge and, and following up uh, on, on other issues. There's always issues that you're concerned with and led in public housing and things like that. And we've been following up with that for a while, uh, but that's always something that we're monitoring. So for us that we also do housing court, um, it, it presents a real problem uh, and uh, that has to be addressed, but we got a great team that, that works on that. So that's the latest thing we're doing. Okay, so, so what I hear you talking about is you know, you guys have been doing community engagement for a long time, um, and um, and that you know is pretty robust. But the the public housing that's part of your catchment area and a dominant um, uh, landlord for your constituents um, isn't maybe uh, as successful in its own engagement of the community as they could be. And so, a way for you to expand is to help facilitate a better. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, we pay attention to repairs, and we can get tenant repairs. And the one thing I will just say quickly is that um, the law is pretty terrible in terms of a court enforcing repairs from New York City housing. So what we decided to do was we're going to go out and do inspections. And when a judge goes out and does inspections uh, of the public housing, all of a sudden 10 people have to show up from New York City housing, and they hate it. So um, that, that was pretty much a practical approach towards getting them to do repairs. And what that means is you, you do inspections, uh, and then the next time someone on the staff calls and says the plaster is falling down off the wall from this, this apartment, they're going to pay attention to it. And so every, you know, every once in a while, we've got to go out and do inspections, remind them you know, they didn't turn the heat on in October when it was cold. So we had to go out and do inspections, and all of a sudden they have a plan to turn the heat on. They turn the heat on. You know, it's, it's constant, shall we say. Uh, but we're on top of it, and we're always looking to improve, and I guess that's what every course should be doing. So, Judge Williams, what would you nominate as a challenge in, in, your, in your work, in your efforts in community justice? Well, I actually have two. One is a good challenge. 
we recently last every year, challenge is a good challenge <laughs> well yes that's true one uh, we recently <laughs> received a SAMHSA grant for a drug court and we received it at the end of 2014 but we actually start the court in 2015 and just and to be clear there so that's that's a grant for the treatment on the yes. treatment side yes mm -hmm. it's actually it allows us to pay for treatment for individuals to go into uh, for substance use issues and uh, We've been really fortunate because we are, per the grant, we're only a lot, we should see maybe 60 people a year, and that's assessed 60 people a year, and we are at 52 actual participants in court, which is great. Um, however, it's creating a little challenge because you've been to our courtroom, it's really small. And so when you have uh, that large number of people showing up, especially in the first phase of drug court, they're there weekly until they phase up, uh, it creates a little bit of an issue. Hmm. So that's one of our challenges is how are we going to go? We don't want to turn anyone down, so are we going to move to another evening? And we have drug court in the evening to allow people to go to work uh, and, then, and then show up for court or how we're going to address it. So that's one of our challenges, but it's a really good challenge because it allows, we are helping the people that we see. And uh, we knew this was an issue through the community court because we were working with other uh, treatment centers uh, for our individuals who came through the court. But you had to have either insurance or some way to get the treatment paid for. And so now we're able to actually get them into the treatment that they need. And if the I could just interject before you go to your yes. second challenge, for anyone who hasn't been to the, uh, the, the South Dallas Community Court, it's a really genius design where uh, instead of creating uh, a new building or, or renovating um, uh, other space, which often needs to happen, they identified uh, a, a vibrant 20-year-old community center um, with all kinds of you know, nursing services and library and, and, and a bunch of other services that were already there that was already being used by the community and then carved out some space for a courtroom and some offices. And as Judge Williams is saying, uh, it's all pretty tight. Um, but, uh, but it was really bringing the court into where the community was already, already gathering. And, and space, I think space is a challenge for everyone, but I can see in your case that that would be particularly challenging. So. Yes. so our second challenge is because we are so involved in the community, and I guess it really is my challenge, is I'm in the community quite a bit. And so eventually you start to hear, that's my judge. And so it's not an issue for me because I know I'm not their judge, but when you're out in the community and someone says to their friend, that's my judge, or they're pointing at you, and particularly I was at a, um, I was emceeing a program for one of the federal judges. And I actually wasn't in Dallas. I was south of Dallas in a small community. And I saw this lady just pointing and pointing and pointing. And I was thinking, she's pointing at the judge. But when he moved away, she was actually pointing at me and uh, with a couple of friends. So she came up and she says, you don't remember me. And of course, I try not to say I don't remember anyone. So I said, oh, yes. And she goes, you're my judge. And <laughs> I was like, OK, OK. <laughs> and I wasn't for sure which court I was her judge, because I do two dockets. I do the community court docket and I do a regular docket. Um, but the next week, and she told me, I'll see you Thursday. So then the light bulb went off. I knew I'd see her in community court. And sure enough, that Thursday, she said, I'm graduating and I want you to take a picture with me because we do that. When they graduate, we take a picture. We do a little graduation ceremony. And so she showed up on that Thursday to graduate. But I get that a lot. So that is kind of a challenge because you don't want anyone to feel like there is an appearance of anything of bias or anything like that. So you just have to be careful, and it's just how you handle yourself in the community. But it doesn't stop me from going out into the community. And then the other thing is my court manager loves to go to every event there is. If you want to know what Ms. Gibson is doing, follow her on Facebook, <laughs> Twitter, and Instagram. She is at every event. So. Um, because she doesn't have a life, she assumes I don't have one either. <laughs> so we are everywhere, everywhere. I mean, there are two events, and we're trying to make all three of those. So that's our challenge. And can I just uh, ask uh, our other two panelists, does that resonate with either of you, this, uh, this notion of you know, being my judge in, in, a, in a challenging way? Because uh, it, 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 I could imagine it's something you'd be proud of, but it, does it have disadvantages? either of you? I don't think so. I, I, I go up the street every day and, and I will uh, uh, 
mostly come across somebody who uh, recognised me, and I've got honestly uh, very little, sometimes very little idea as to whether or not they've been an accused, a victim, uh, uh, domestic violence uh, responded. I've got no no uh, idea about it. But can I answer your question that you've asked the other two? Sure. About a challenge. Yeah. Yes. And no, I, we're, 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 yeah. <laughs> we weren't. Not that I want to control here. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the challenge for for us really has been uh, our own success. That's what I think's been our our, mm. our challenge. Um, without being you know, suffering from hubris, we I think fair to say we've we've been reasonably successful. Mm -hmm. The yeah. the uh, uh, the crime rates reduced by uh, thirty percent, and we have good relations with uh, the community, and have good crime prevention strategies, and good community engagement. Our court prices are, are, are pretty good, second to none, I would say. But what does that mean for the uh, for the other four million uh, plus uh, Victorians? Is is our worry? Mm. Uh, so here we are, sitting in in Collingwood. Uh, doing pretty well for the people in that municipality, uh, in that area of Melbourne. But it, but we, our challenge is to uh, think: well, what can we do for the rest of the justice system, rather than just be self-congratulatory about how good uh, we're doing and what we're doing for our community? Uh, that's so. Our that's challenge. Uh, that is a great challenge for all of us um, when we think of of community courts in particular as kind of laboratories for testing new ideas. What does it mean to come up with better ways to do things if they can't be shared with the wider system? So you that? set yourself up. What? Can I speak to that real fast? Well, uh, I know uh, Magistrate his... Fanning wants to, and then we'll, we'll oh. certainly uh, come back to It wasn't to a you. complete setup, I have to say. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but so what are you doing about that as a challenge, if you feel that well, as a challenge? We were always set up with a, with a view to uh, being the laboratory. That was that was what uh, the government had in mind, uh, but it never really worked out that way at the beginning because we were establishing ourselves. I mean, we were struggling uh, really to uh, es establish the neighbourhood justice centre, get the relationships right with the uh, with the police. They were, as I've heard everywhere else, uh, quite um, frankly antagonistic weren't taking it seriously, thought it was going to be a disgrace to have the, uh, the Neighbourhood Justice Centre really there and, you know, why, did, why couldn't they have a real court? Uh, and it was all going to be kumbaya and incense and soft music and uh, all their hard work prosecuting would be undone. So, you know, there were lots of challenges like that and, you know, frankly now they're uh, our greatest supporters, you know, they are a bit like what uh, Judge Pratt was saying, you know, they are out there advocating for the uh, importance of uh, the Neighbourhood Justice Centre and having people come to the Neighbourhood Justice Centre. Um, but what we've done is we've really tried to look for opportunities in the wider court system uh, to assist the court system in doing their work better. Um, one of the ways that we've uh, done that is to go into some digital areas and one of those areas was in uh, domestic violence, what we call family violence, but de it's the same, uh, and to enable people to, mostly women, because it is mostly women of course who are the subject of uh, domestic violence, to make an application online. So they don't have to come into the courthouse, uh, they can sit in private, in their own space uh, to uh, provide them to have a computer, and most people do, uh, to be able to uh, make that application online. Ultimately, of course, they have to come to court to follow through on the application, but they can make that application uh, uh, over the period of a month. It stays alive for a month. Uh, or they can do it immediately if they like, but if they want to spend more time thinking about it and contemplating it, as often they do, uh, then they can do that through the computer uh, at their own pace, at their own leisure. Uh, and um, we, it has two effects. One, it's very important for the person who's making the application because of the reasons that I just articulated, but also it saves court staff time. They don't have to sit down and go through the application uh, with uh, individuals who are making the application. So that's of great help to, uh, to, to busy courts because they're, uh, they're able to be able to do that.
And you guys and piloted it. And, we've piloted and it, and it's been embraced by the wider court system. Nice. Um, so it, it's good in itself, but also good for the credibility of the Neighbourhood Justice Centre in terms of what we might say about other things uh, that we're listened to and we're, I suppose, taken seriously. It's one example, and there's a number of other examples that I could give you, but we are looking for, and I'd guess encourage you all if you can because, I mean, is it 50 uh, community courts throughout the US? Even if it was double to 100, and even if we doubled it to two or three in Australia, it's still, you know, what, one community court for millions of millions of people. Uh, it's never going to happen that we're going to carpet either country or UK either uh, with uh, community courts. So we should be, uh, I think, uh, looking for opportunities to uh, uh, influence the wider court system. Certainly it's modelling, and I completely agree with uh, Judge Pratt in terms of doing that, but it shouldn't be just the, the judges that are doing it. It should be kind of all of you who are, who are involved in administration and service providers doing it as well. Great. Looking for those opportunities. Thank you. That's such a such an important point. So, Judge Williams, um, I was going to add uh, when you said, "How do you?" What we've done in Dallas, because the South Dallas court started in 2004, and it was the first, is that we've actually expanded to three courts, and they all cover a certain part of a certain area. And now we're about to open the fourth court. Mm -hmm. So when when it's doing good work and the word is out there, our, our city council really does like community court. So our fourth court, they're opening and they're actually doing it with general funds, which is a first. Because mm. our courts, of course, are always out looking for money, but they really like what we're doing so much. And that court's going to be in a very challenging area, uh, a heavily immigrated area where there's numerous languages spoken and a lot of mistrust of police. So what we've learned to do in the other three areas three uh, community court uh, sites is what we're going to have to take to North Dallas and and get the police officers on board and they have because we have such a good rapport with them from the other locations uh, once they see the work I'm sure they'll be easy to get on board and then just get getting the trust between the the residents in that area with the police so that is going to be, but I think that's kind of how you address it, is try to expand community court as much and as you can. And your first three, I know, were in existing community centers. Is the fourth one going to be as well? Or? No, it's okay. going to be, right now it's, we're going to do a temporary location. It's actually going to be in an old fire station, but it's being renovated. So it okay. will be in a temporary, because, we, because the council doesn't want us to wait. They want it up and running. We're going to go to a temporary relocation first, and then once the fire station has been renovated, we'll go into that location. So D Dallas being the star jurisdiction that it is uh, uh, has more to the story. And um, yesterday we heard uh, the BJ director announce the 10 uh, winners of the community court uh, grants. And um, South Dallas, the area served by Judge Williams's court, is going to be served by a new community court. Uh, so you're going sideways, but you're also drilling down. And so do you want to just talk about that? The, and the, the partnership aspect of that, I think, is something that's really, um, really interesting to us. I mean, when we heard about that, we were like, nobody does that. That's really impressive. OK, well, we've been working with we do a prostitution docket. I'm going to go back a little bit. We do what's called a prostitution initiative docket, um, and we do it every quarter. And at that docket, it's a collaboration of the local police, the sheriff's office, the district attorney, the public defender, the community court, and lots of social service providers, as well as Dallas County Health. And in that process, we've just built such a good relationship with our public defender that when we started our drug court, our public defender, the public defender for Dallas County, actually serves as the public defender for the drug court. And in seeing that process, and she's over at the larger court handling the felonies and the other higher misdemeanor cases, she would refer and talk to the different judges about, hey, this is a good defendant that should go to the city of Dallas's drug court. And for whatever reason, they weren't eligible for the, the felony drug court. But they still had a, drug, a substance use issue, maybe a mental health issue, co-occurring disorders. And she would um, 
let those judges know. And, and so those defendants would actually be referred to our drug court. And we work with two courts in particular. One is a mental health court in the misdemeanor level, and another one is the second chance court and the felony court. And they have referred defendants to our court and had an opportunity to see the work that we do along with the prompting of our public defender who not only serves, she also serves on the National Association of Drug Court uh, Professionals on their board. So we have an expert working with us. Well, in the process, because the court was also watching us, the felony judge, and what he was handling in his second chance court is individuals between the ages of 17 and 25 who live in the South Dallas area who are, have drug cases. They may not, it may be possession, it may be delivery, but they're, they're drug cases or they're involved in the drug culture somehow. It's a way to reach out to those individuals and give them a second chance because most of the people that are young between the ages of 20, 17 and 25 in the area that uh, the court serves, they're not working. So this is their hustle and you have to retrain them, get them to see life a little bit differently. So this court is going to operate on um, bi-weekly on a Friday, in South Dallas Court, and facing out toward the community, and this is where those individuals will come in. They will have a case manager. It's essentially, drug, it's essentially community court because they're gonna have a case manager, uh, and that's not something that happens in felony court. In felony court, you have a probation officer. So they will actually have a case manager. They will be assessed like we do in community court to see what their needs are, and then those will become parts of their conditions of their probation. They will have, if they need to get their GED, if they need to go to a literacy class, those will be things that will happen. And of course, the partnership is with uh, an agency called City Square, where they have access to job training, as well as all of the health necessary health benefits. There is a, a, a they'll be able, they'll be referred to those as well, and um, mental health assessments as well, and counseling, individual counseling if needed. And of course, if they need the substance use, then they'll refer them back to our drug court, which is also held at the South Dallas Community Court. So it's just a way to expand. But this is actually a district court judge coming into the community because he saw what the South Dallas Community Court did, how well we interacted with the community. So they're taking our model and they're going to utilize it for the felony offenders. Yeah, taking their model, taking their space, taking their community and serving it um, even more deeply. And they're one of two uh, of the 10 uh, community court sites who are serving this young adult population that was mentioned yesterday. There's gonna be a, a special session on that topic tomorrow. So we're really pleased that you guys uh, are moving to that level. Julius, so can I just add something? Yes, yeah, so you're, I just you're, you're add, next and then we'll okay. go to questions. Well, what's happened in, in New York is that uh, our city council set up a commission uh, chaired by the retired chief judge, um, Jonathan Lipman, and the goals of the commission, there are many goals, but, but they talk about reducing incarceration, and they talk about expanding community court. And, and many of you know, uh, James Brodick has done like a phenomenal job out in Brownsville. Getting James, ready. raise your hand. Where's James? Where's JB? Getting ready for that community court, and it's, been, it's kind of interesting, the New York Times seems to be pushing for that community court. Um, so there's now a commission to expand uh, community courts, literally saying, you know, we need Brownsville. Um, so it's nice, to, and the other part that they have set up is supervised release. So, you know, many judges uh, have in jail or out of jail, and then there's a third option, and that's for, for judges where ordinarily you would be setting bail, you're willing to release someone under supervision. So it significantly reduces the pretrial incarceration. The, it, it is supervised, it's now in all five boroughs, uh, with with uh, CCI leading the charge, of course, uh, and 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 basically those uh, supervised will report back to the court uh, whether a person is responding as they're supposed to be responding. But again, the goal is to reduce the incarceration, in particular the pretrial incarceration issue that we all have, because that's obviously that's you know based on poverty for many people. So uh, it's interesting to see the politicians pick up on what you know we all have been doing in community justice. Who has questions? Yeah. Can I just make one other, other point I, I meant to make in terms of what we've done, another example, and I thought 
was a good example of what we've been able to do f to assist the mainstream courts, and that was in the Aboriginal uh, area. Can I just make that point quickly? That is our Indigenous population. Uh, our incarceration, fortunately, is nothing like what it is here. I think it's six times less. Uh, but, in the, but in the Aboriginal community, although it's a small community, it's about double what it is for the, in fact, in some areas, it's greater uh, than it is for the um, rest of the uh, population. One of the, other, one of the other courts wanted to utilise what we'd done in our court, which was establish a particular list for Aboriginal persons because we were having a lot of trouble with uh, people not being represented. I was issuing lots of lots of warrants for their apprehension because they were not turning up. Uh, and they were, when they did come, they didn't have representation or they weren't uh, uh, being assisted by their relevant services. So we had a particular day once a month for Aboriginals and that was the Aboriginal Hearing Day. And it worked very well. We had lots of services there, they were all represented and they were engaged and connected to services. So it was um, successful. One of the other courts uh, thought, well, that was a very good idea and, and approached us to assist them in being able to establish an Aboriginal Hearing Day as well. So providing uh, a kind of technical assistance for exactly. a neighbouring jurisdiction. Exactly. Excellent. Yeah. So, sir, would uh, you tell us your name? Uh, Ron Chance, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, question for Judge Williams. In terms of your community court expansion, uh, you mentioned uh, the recent expansion, you got general funds. What's been the economics, budgetary economics of court expansion? I mean, did you get grants to expand to the second court? And yes. how much money did it cost to... Uh, for the third expansion, and, and is it a part of maybe knitting services, existing services together, you know, with the expansion? We definitely use existing services as much as possible, and we work with a lot of faith-based services as well because they give, they have so much to provide, and they're already doing it. So we just, you know, they 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 love the fact that we're sending people to them as well. And most of the social services, they need numbers, so we work that way with them. Uh, the court that we're expanding to, the area that we're expanding to, has a ton more of social services than we actually have where we're located. Because the neighborhood, the area, is a lot more affluent than the area that we're at. It's just a carved out area of it that's not uh, as nice, but the rest of North Dallas is very affluent, and so they're excited to have the community court. Uh, Ms. Gibson's here, she can give you the numbers. Yeah. So and if they, you talk to me afterwards, I can give you numbers and things like that. But generally speaking, we think of Dallas as being a, a great example of running on a shoestring. Definitely. Um, we don't <laughs> have a lot of money. We yeah. When you expanded the second time, what, how did you select that community? Just briefly before we go to the next question, does anybody want to comment city on that? City council or? members. Our city council members and the need, <laughs> and the need, but they, they really embrace it and they want it, okay, I need one in my community. I see what you're doing over here, I need this. So that's kind of what happens. Do you want to uh, stand up and introduce yourself yes. and ask your question? Um, my name's Lindsay LaPointe, I'm from Chicago. I'm with the Adult Redeploy Illinois program here in Illinois. Um, so my question comes out of what Judge Calabrese said in regards to how to change culture. You, you're getting better results and then you share those better results um, with court actors who, who might need to be pushed along. So my question is kind of that that speaks to data. You know, you might need some data to show those better results. So what kind of data, maybe real-time data, maybe not real-time data, does your court or, or anyone's court um, need to show the better results? Um, it, outcome evaluations kind of take a long time. Um, so those aren't necessarily the go-to. Um, We've found a little bit in our work that due to scarcity mode of, of everybody and court actors, qu courts often can't even articulate what kind of performance measurement data or maybe even qualitative data they would need. So kind of what, what kind of data do you need more to make your case? Okay. Um. Well, we were fortunate to have an evaluation done by the National Institutes of Justice, National Center for State Courts. So that's a 500-page evaluation. So we had that, um, and, and so that's great. But obviously, you're not going to walk around with, you know, a 500-page evaluation. 
and hand it to people. Um, I think was really important a, a couple things. Presence in the community, uh, presence of, of your people attached to the court at community meetings. Now, you may say, well, that's not statistics, but it's personalizing to a certain extent of justice. It's being there, it's listening to the issues. They see you're there, they see you care, and already they're gonna get a better feeling about the community court because you're not removed from the community, you're part of the community, and you understand what the issues are. And then, uh, you know, NYPD, and I'm sure most police departments keep crime stats. So um, what happens in, in New York is that uh, if, you have, if you're a, a police captain, you have a spike in crime, you're hauled uh, to ComStat meetings. That's where you stand there, very much like this, where I'm the captain with a, with a spike in crime and all of the other captains are present and I'm being grilled by someone like Kim who's gonna ask all sorts of questions about why I have a spike in crime and what am I doing about it. They hate that. So what's happened is they don't get called down to ComStat because their crime stats started low and have remained low. So that's one good thing. And then the other thing is you know, almost everyone who started as a captain, they rotate about every two or three years. They've been in business 15 years, cover three precincts, literally over 90%. Almost everyone who started as a captain has left as, uh, as an inspector, has gotten a promotion. And they're all judged on crime stats. So you're, the, the stats you might, not need, uh, you might need might be found in police stats and police department stats if, you, if they're looking at the reduction of crime. Um, so, I mean, we did have an evaluation. We know things are going better. We knew it before the evaluation. We know afterwards. But if you're looking for stats, you might be able to find it there. But presence in the community is a really, really important part of community justice. And just to build on that, of course, we're having a research uh, presentation uh, a little bit later today. But there are a lot of things that you can count at home. Uh, you know, increasing the number of sentencing options that judges have in the first place. Uh, how much those get used? Are, are these alternative sanctions being used more than they had been? What, uh, if they're being used, that's great. Are people complying with them? What are the compliance rates? Um, if you're using community service, what's the value of the, yes. the work that's being performed in the community? Uh, things like that um, uh, are very easy to, I mean, they're, they're not easy, but, they're, but it's very possible to track that information on your own without waiting for independent evaluators to come in um, and to prepare yourself for, for when that does happen. I think we have room for one more question. This is actually not a question. I just want to make a quick comment on this. I just want to caution folks that I think over time in criminal justice, what we've discovered is um, it, we're not we're not necessarily in every case trying to completely reduce recidivism. And I think somebody made this important point yesterday, which I, I really want to make sure we're framing this correctly. If people are taking a longer time before they recidivate, or if the nature of what they're doing is less serious, those are successes too. So mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. define so success in a way that you know, may not be possible, right, for your clients. If, we're, if they're making progress, that is success. And I think it's really important for us to, to make sure we're framing the, the definition, you know. Thank right. you for Can that, Betsy. Julius. Another way that you can uh, let the community know what's going on and what we do is we try to do little success stories and they're snippets because all of our defendants sign waivers. So we let, them, we let the community know like a success story uh, we had one young lady who just wandered around the community, and so we've done, we did um, an email out to most of our partners, or all of our partners, so they could see where she was, and she's still in our drug court program, but from beginning to now, it's majorly different. And another thing that we do is we try to let the police officers know our successes, because sometimes those that are on the street, they're not looking at the crime stats, but those are the ones that are coming into contact with individuals and encouraging them to come to court. So just letting them know what's going on and how they help someone helps them to feel good about what they're doing. Yeah, th thank you. And that's so important going to your question uh, about you know, performance indicators. Police get no feedback. Uh, all they see is who's out on the street now and who they're arresting and, and who they arrested before. And so being able to, to, to give them information about your compliance rates and ideally having some baseline to compare that to uh, in, the, in the sort of status quo um, is really, really helpful uh, and, and kind of essential for getting um, 
police uh, support as well as community support. Even, so even better if you can get the police to give you their anecdotes about yeah, their successes. Yeah, yeah great. Um, There's no better spokesman yes. on your behalf than someone else. Yeah. Including uh, the police. Can I just <coughs> That's right. Like, can I just add one thing? Then? Judge um, Calabrese. Oh, did you want to say something? I just want to say that one of the, one of the anecdotes the police used in regard to one person was that they, uh, uh, they were so concerned about him, seeing him around, but he's not committing offences and they can't work out why, yeah. and so they're actually putting him over and asking him, why, is, why aren't you committing offences? Can I get pulled over for yeah. nothing? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Um, and uh, he told them about how, uh, what great service he was getting from the neighbourhood justice centre. Anyway, he was on a different uh, pathway and they, uh, they found it very hard to believe, but ultimately did have to believe it and now trot that out as one of their... Well, that's uh, a great story. Yeah. Judge Calabrese? I just want to add one thing. You know, one of the programs, which I, I won't get into too much detail about, that we have is peacemaking. We learned it from the, the tribal community um, and... Uh, we have a great DA, so we can send cases out to peacemaking. Uh, started with neighborhood dis uh, neighbor disputes, then, then stranger assaults, then we added graffiti because of the success. We added personal enhancement uh, programs. Kids were having uh, difficulty at home with a parent or parents. Uh, we just started a police pe peacemaking program. We retired police officers as part of that circle. Basically, it's, it's, it's a, a circle. Um, but one of the best nights we've, we've had at Red Hook was the peacemaking graduation uh, because you have to be trained as a peacemaker. And, and what was so phenomenal and, and literally heartwarming to me was to see the young people from Red Hook so excited about being involved in justice because basically the court hands the cases to peacemakers. Our DA will back it up and respect that decision. Again, over like 95% of the time, they come back and they say, we're satisfied with the result. It's victim-led. The victim will say, I'm satisfied. I don't want an order of protection. Heartwarming stories, individual stories in, in the courtroom about, about how they've gotten back together, no issues going forward. But to see young people literally charged up and excited about being involved in justice, I'm saying to myself, boy, that's what this country needs.